welcome to We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. And I'm Stephen. And this is a repeat offenders edition. And what a repeat offenders edition is, sometimes we'll get people on the show. And we have a really good chat with them. And then a couple of months down the line I'll think, ooh, I liked having that person on the show. So we asked to get them back on. So um, the last time it's Stephen Rhodes. So hello Stephen. Hello. It's good to have you back on. It's good to be back on. It's been far too long. I was kind of looking at the stats as I like to do. And I think you were on March. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It almost feels like a lifetime ago. It, it's like a long time ago, and I was looking at it, but I was like, okay, because I was kind of thinking, well, should I just have a look around and and see how long ago it was? But it was actually, it was twenty second of March, and then you're thinking, well, that's not that long ago, and then somebody says, well, it's almost the twenty second of August, which mm. is a little while ago. But um, it's good to have you back on, mate. Thank you. It's it's nice to be back on. It's it's good to talk all you've... things nerdy. <laughs> it's always good to talk all things nerdy. Now, um, for everybody that's joining us for the first time, hello, and thank you for coming along. Have a seat. Get yourself a cup of tea at the refreshments machine. Grab yourself some custard creams. I believe there's some jammy dodgers outside as well for all those who are willing to wait. Um, the reason that we do this is... Because we don't think there's enough podcasts out there about board games. and mm, s- No. Definitely not. And the second reason that we do this is because I want to get Stephen back on. So there you go. I don't need to give an excuse. It's our podcast. So um, you've been busy. Um, oh, definitely. Um, yes. Life-changing busyness. Yeah, some, some life-changing busyness. Some... Usual endless busyness. There's, uh, there's many flavors of busy, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> life changing. I had I had the craziest. Yeah, the week the like first week in July is probably the the busiest week of my life so far. Having um, got married and turned thirty and relocated my partner to Canada, it was it was quite the week. <laughs> Was that just that was just one week. That was just one week. Oh, there was also <laughs> um, there was also a stag do as well. So there was a stag do and the, and gay married and turning thirty and uh, relocating my partner to Canada. Did it combine into all one big stag do kind of wedding party type thing? Did you manage to actually separate stuff out? Was there enough time to enjoy the stag do, recover from the stag do, and then go straight into the wedding, or was there enough kind of gapishness? To do that. Uh, I mean, I, I literally flew back to England, I think, on the Thursday. Right. And I had the stag do on the Saturday, and then Monday I got married, and then Wednesday we uh, we flew back to Canada, and then Thursday was my 30th birthday. So, <laughs> and then the days between was basically trying to see everyone that we know in England at once because I, I don't go back often so it was like trying to see everyone like just who who needed to be seen and we didn't get anywhere near like we didn't get a chance to see everyone that we wanted to see which is why it was kind of nice like having the wedding because it was it, it gave it gave us a chance to see everyone because yeah. we invited everyone to us rather than us having to travel around seeing everyone else yeah it was nice because cool. we everyone came to us for a change so that was that was quite nice and you would have got a whack of presents at the same time, which is always nice. It's like you're not only coming to see us, you might have to give us some things as well for the privilege of seeing us too, which is always good. Always a good thing. Was it a big quite was it a biggish wedding? Was it a quiet affair? Um it was it was pretty small. It was it was very close uh okay. friends and family. There was only like I think it was like twenty five people there in total, so it was pretty low key. Um yeah, it was, but we we it was very short notice in terms of like planning and everything, so it needed to be small, really. Yeah, yeah. Did you kind of have your window, and then you had to kind of get sort of things sorted out for that kind of time? 
pretty much yeah it was yeah. it was uh, yeah it was like a military operation but it, it went fine and okay. it was a really good day and uh, you know everything went well and the move over here was was fine and yeah it was <laughs> but it was like i considering it was technically a week off work and like a week of holiday it was the most stressful holiday of my <laughs> entire life. i came back to work and i was like ah oh, all i have to do is work now this is great <laughs> I just need to use my brain and do creative writing and organise stuff. This is absolutely, fant- absolutely fantastic. Yeah, well, when I take a when I take a week off writing, I get really like fidgety as it is. So yeah. it was, yeah, it was nice to. Sounds ridiculous, but it was nice to come back to work and and just get life back to normal after like all the craziness. I crave you nine to five. Come back. I know. <laughs> It's I, it's only the creative aspects of my job that I crave. It's not the yeah. being in an office and nine to five that no. <laughs> that, that really <laughs> pulls me in. But last time we spoke, um, there's a couple of things we obviously want to talk about. Um, one of the things is I guess we should touch on the game that you were working on at the time, which was uh, your lovely isometric 3D type little game seven the days long gone yes how that at least how's that going is that all kind of wrapped up are you getting close to kind of finishing that off as far as i take it your job's kind of finished on that are they moving towards kind of releasing it now yeah um it's it's been going really really well um the guys over at fool's theory and in, in uh, poland which is where where they're based mm-hmm. um they've done they've been working really really hard um you know, much harder than I have just being the writer on it, but they've been they've been slogging away getting the game like looking better and feeling better and, and it's all coming together really nicely. Um yeah, my my job's not completely over with, but it's hmm. it's starting to wind down. Like I'm still doing um some tech stuff and, and some little bits and bobs here and there and hmm. um but yeah it's 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 shaping up really nicely. I'm like super, super proud of it and, and the work that everyone's put into it, you know, me. Uh the like the the stuff I've done as well as Tom, my my uh, co-writer on the game, yeah. um, he's done really well, and it's his it's his first game project, like proper game project in the industry. So it's I know it's a it's a big deal for him, and it, it, he's done some super good work. So I'm I'm really really excited now for the game to to come out and people to play it and yeah. to see what people think of it. It's always nice when you've been working on something for like a year or two or longer and then it finally gets out there and you get to see what people are doing and what they think and you know see the the videos on youtube people playing through it. it's always a nice it's always a nice feeling and are you i mean this polishing i mean i guess sorry not the polishing but the kind of the going back is that kind of fixing kind of potential loose ends and the kind of the writing side of things or is that just is this me just making sure everything's kind of aligning together that nothing's kind of left out in the open kind of thing yeah, so it's there's a number of factors of of, of what you do. It's uh, a bit of it is like pure editing, where you're like going back and fixing mistakes that you've made in in like frantic writing. <laughs> you know, you've missed like you know like punctuation, grammar, and making sure all the names are consistent and the the, the terms we use are consistent. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just making sure everything aligns uh, within the collective vision of, of the project and making sure that the dialogue is. You know, because, I mean, I could rewrite things forever. I could constantly keep going over yeah. work that I've written and scripts that I've written. So eventually there has to be a stopping point. So it's good that, you know, there's like, there's a finite point where the line is drawn. It's like, okay, we can only tweak things and change things up to this point and then it has to stop. So it's, I always like having that, that line in the sand drawn there yeah. to work towards. Um, so yeah, it's, there's been some, tweaks made and some corrections mm-hmm. but it's it's mainly just me yeah, polishing things up and, cool. and making sure everything fits where it should do and, and that the, there's no conflicting information because you know sometimes when you write something at the start of the project and then you write something about the same topic towards mm-hmm. the end of the project there's a very high chance that that thing could have changed meaning or changed definition or something during the course of the project yeah and so it's always important to go back through the older stuff and make sure that it still fits with the vision of of the later stuff so is tom i mean is tom like your sanity checker and are you like his sanity checker so that you're you kind of take bits off each other and, and you're the guys that kind of 
drawing the line in the sand for each other and saying, look, this is, you've done everything that you can do with this piece, anything else becomes kind of overwork. And is that, is that how it kind of, kind of works between the two of you? Yeah, I mean, with Tom, Tom initially, I brought Tom initially onto the project, um, to basically help me out with, um, the amount of writing that needed to be doing. Cause me and, uh, Kuba, the creative director, we had, the vision for the game, like, from the very beginning, and we, it was me and him that was always hashing the ideas out, and I brought Tom on just because I realised that the game was going to need a lot of writing, and I mm. didn't think that I would have time to do it all, which I was right. Yeah. Um, and so I brought Tom on just to help me with the writing, but then he he just sort of came into his own when he got on the project, and he really, um, he really got stuck in and ended up being like, yeah, like, you know, um, being being there in every aspect of the project, and he was helping me. He would look over my scripts, and I would look over his, and then we'd mm. give each other's notes. And he would suggest ideas for places where uh, me and Cooper were struggling with something, or he would he would really contribute in the brainstorm, and and he would always bring um, a really fresh take. And um, because me and Cooper come from not similar backgrounds, but we both worked at CD Projekt together, so a lot of yeah. our working yeah. methods uh, derive a lot from what we learned at CDP, yeah. whereas Tom didn't have that um, experience, but that allowed him to bring a completely different perspective to the same content, which I think was really useful. Um, and at the start, when we first started working together, I was, give, I was giving him a lot of guidance on like how to write games, uh, how to write characters, um, but like, you know, we're, we're like I think almost two years now down the road of development and now it's like, you know, I know I don't have to do any of that. I know that he, I know that if he's doing a piece of work, uh, I know that he'll nail it and that all I have to do is look at it and, and do like slight course corrections or make suggestions just to tie it into the overall vision because the game is so big yeah. and the world building is so, so like vast that it's really hard for any one person to, to understand all the different moving parts. So that's, that's kind of where we, we help each other out is that he'll have, like some of the concepts in the game he's come up with. And so when I'm then writing something that relates to them, he, he helps me by, by making sure that it fits with what the, what the contents, um, like point was yeah. in the grand scheme of things. So it's, yeah, it's, it's been very much a, like he supports me, I support him. Um, and then we, we both align as, as the writing team to then to then work with Kuba who's the creative director who has his own vision and his own drives and then you know we sort of we're like two halves of the same coin I guess that's pretty cool so have you do you have a release date then um to avoid putting my own <laughs> foot in my mouth not that I'm aware of no you're right okay. um I know that I know that the seven uh, social media pages posted a teasy um, post like a, a week or two ago saying that something was coming soon. I don't know whether that pertains to a release date, but it was there's something coming. Um, yeah, I mean Europe has a really big gaming uh, convention coming up soon at Gamescom. It's yeah. in Germany, and um, I imagine if people pay attention to Gamescom, they might see some kind of seven announcement or something there but i don't know what it or what it would be um the one of the downsides of living in canada when the development team is in poland is that i'm sometimes out of the loop with certain things <laughs> you probably be having like a six hour time difference yeah exactly most people will be asleep and finish their day and they'll forget to well better send uh better send Stephen the email to let them know kind of what we what we're going to be up to are you still yeah. um Obviously, you mentioned CD kind of Project Red, but you still um, are you still at Ubisoft at the moment yourself? Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm at Ubisoft in Quebec City. And how's how's that going at the moment? How's that working? Yeah, it's going it's going really well. I uh, I'm really enjoying it there, and um, the uh, the work I'm doing is really really interesting, and I find it really exciting. Um, cool. So yeah, it's going it's going well, and I really like living in Quebec as well. I think it's it's a really nice city. All right. How's the how's the Blood Bowl League? Has it started up again? And how are you getting you know, on with it? <laughs> so you knew this is, question was coming up. Yeah. So I basically, <laughs> I I was I had to drop out of it essentially because I was so busy I didn't oh. have time to play. So <laughs> I bought all my Blood Bowl on, uh, my Blood Bowl, sorry, um, and just yeah, and then 
I got really busy and I was like, oh, I can't, I can't play guys. So That's I think they've just finished this season. So I'm going to jump in when they start the new season. I think in September. So I gotta that. find a bit on the previous show. Where you're like, I'm really excited about. <laughs> getting I, know, I was so upset. I was really, really upset. I was like, oh god. Oh no, that is just an absolute, an absolute shame. But um, so Blood Bowl gone completely. Yeah. Apart from your blushing bride, what else has been taking up your time? Have you had any time to get any cardboard? Or resiny, plasticky type stuff to the table at all. Um, so I've I've been doing a, a little bit of board gaming. Okay. Um, but I have also been very much into the new Warhammer Forty Thousand. Um, that sort of got me all excited again. Let's talk about this because, and let's talk about it in as much detail as you care to talk about because. Nobody else has been on the show recently to talk about 40,000 or Warhammer 40k or whatever they care to call it. And the likelihood is now I'm going to ban anyone else from talking about Warhammer for the next couple of months. So the floor is yours. I mean, I'm intrigued as to know when you weren't able to play Blood Bowl, what made you decide to go and pick up a copy? Okay, so I... Didn't really pick up a copy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have um, some mutual friends and right. business acquaintances uh, who work for GW who were very kind enough to send me um, a copy of uh, the Dark Imperium box set when it came out. Um, so Warhammer 40k was sort of thrust upon me um, very willingly. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't play the poor man's card with me. Do you know, so, oh, they sent me this game. I didn't know. Oh my god. Yeah. Goodness. So, so that. So I, I got sent a copy of that. Um, and I, I mean, I've always been to 40k. Like the 40k universe is one of my, one of my oldest loves. Like I've, I've yeah. been into it since I was a little boy. Like since I was like 11, I think I first started the hobby. So like you know, 20 years. Um, 20 years of uh, playing that game um, and I played it a lot during like 3rd and 4th edition but then I really didn't like the direction they took with the later editions to the mm. point where I just stopped playing it and switched to other games Yeah. but I really liked Age of Sigmar and I really liked the the natural evolution of 40k from Age of Sigmar where it still feels very much like 40k, but mm. the rules are much more streamlined and everything plays really smoothly and everything feels relatively balanced. And it's, I like that they've actually started pushing the story forward because I've always been into the, the lore and the background of 40k. I've always found it yeah. super, super interesting. So it's, like, it's really cool to see them actually start moving the story forward and actually changing things. So I was just like, for me, 8th edition is like the ushering in of the golden age of 40k. I think this will oh, probably be the best time for 40k players and for the setting itself. I think this is, I think this will be a boom of, of the thing. I think this, I think you'll see them push it everywhere. I think it'll start like branching. I mean, they've, I mean, they announced yesterday they've partnered with a new RPG company to make, uh, I think it's called Wrath and Glory, a new 40k yeah. um, tabletop RPG. Yeah. Um, so it's, I can I can see it getting everywhere now because I think the game's really good and I think they've made a lot of decisions that needed to be made that are positive changes to the game and supporting the gaming community, which I think it was lacking for a long time, which were making Games Workshop's competitors seem like better choices and I think now they've really started to aggressively push back and make some make like because the models are amazing like even it, like the the models have always been good but the models at the moment are like incredible and love them or hate them yeah. the new primaris space marines i think are amazing <laughs> i think they look awesome i think they're like like they're the first like true scale marines and they look so good on the tabletop and but they're even bigger aren't they i mean they're slightly bigger than your normal size well yeah that they're, they're, they're supposedly true scale 
this is what they've said. These are supposed to be, like, in terms of the scale of the game, mm-hmm. these are meant to be the actual size of what a Space Marine should always have been. Because um, the Space Marines have always been little, because, like, you know, I don't know how much you've, you've played or touched these models or whatever, but, like, if you put I... a Space Marine next to, like, Acadian, like, Imperial Guardsmen, they're mm. basically the same size, when a Space Marine should probably be twice as big as the Guardsmen. Well, I mean, in all fairness, I kind of um, <clears throat> I cut my teeth on a copy of Space Crusade, which I was showing off some photographs and then headed into advanced space, space crusade, mucked around with some orcs for a while as well. For the here's an interesting thing. You will get people that will be aware of the hot will be aware of Games Workshop, but might not have never ventured into the forty K world because you're kind of approaching wargaming, let's mm. face it. For those guys out there that are sitting there going, well, why why should I get involved in 40k? What's the basics behind it? Let's strip this back a bit because as, as we always like to do, we kind of like to, we don't always like to assume that people, well, I definitely don't know what I'm talking about, but um, <laughs> for people that haven't played 40k, what's the kind of the basics behind it? What do you do? Okay, well, so the setting is what I'd call, I think they call it this as well, I think it's gothic space fantasy. Yeah. Right, so it's like it's set in the far future, like the forty-first millennium, where humanity has spread through the stars and had this huge empire that was awesome, and then now it's besieged on all sides by all sorts of aliens. You've got traitors, and there's this whole huge kerfuffle that's happened, <laughs> and now there's a bigger kerfuffle that's happening. <laughs> basically, like you're using open warfare as kerfuffle. <laughs> <laughs> endless warfare <laughs> the basic premise is you you and your friend you put down your armies of miniatures which will have like soldiers it'll have yeah. tanks it'll have like you know mighty heroes it'll have like robot walker things that are actually like mortally wounded soldiers encased in tombs that are then connected to a mech that then go and fight for you which i mean if that doesn't sell you on the game i don't know what does i know and it's dice, uh, and it's lots and there's loads and lo- of dice, there's lots buckets, of dice, buckets, <laughs> and buckets and buckets of d6, <laughs> buckets, and buckets of kerfuffle. And you basically paint you paint your awesome miniatures, and you yeah. put them on the table, and then you and your friends roll dice and take each other's toys off the table in mm. gloriously hilarious fashion, using a ruler or um, a tape measure. Tape or measure. A- or I've seen fancy people using um, laser pointers as well to to mm. kind of measure when things are impacting, and I think that's maybe potentially taking it a bit a bit kind of too. A bit yeah, that's very war soon. machiney. That like working out arcs and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's what I love about forty k now is that what used to be like a twenty page, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's twenty pages of core rules. Like you need to yeah. know and memorize these twenty pages to play the game. Hmm. They've taken that and turned it into like four or something it's like they've they condensed it down so it's really easy to just pick up and play it and it feels much more cinematic like you've got you know overwatch you've got and and the way that units interact with each other and the way close combat works and Mm. they've just they've made it very very cinematic on the tabletop but they've simplified the rules enough where there's less focus on flicking through a book to work out what's happening and more focus on what's going on in the tabletop and i think that i think that's really important i think that's you know because i've played uh, games like war machine um which are very very technical games they have very very precise rules everything is um like explained to the nth degree so that there's no room for wrong interpretation yeah because yeah. It, because it's very much a tournament game and it's a very much a tournament gamers game mm, it's, mm-hmm. it's designed for people to play competitively so there can't be any room for misinterpretation whereas games workshop have taken maybe a slightly different approach of we want you to put your toys on the table and roll dice and play games and have fun but there's also an additional set of rules that can be added to the base rules as like a module which makes it I mean, not as competitive, or like not as technically complex as like War Machine, but it adds that complexity that would be needed to play it at like a tournament level. 
Um, and I like that structure. I like that they give you... They do this whole three ways to play thing, which is the gimmick, which is, like, there's three ways to play the game. You can play it, like, telling stories. You can play it, like, competitively. Yeah. Or you can play it where you just put all the toys on the table that you want and you just smash each other to bits. And that's... that. It's like they give you all the different ways to play the game. And I think I think that's really, really cool to see. There's not been... Interestingly enough, I've not seen... Or maybe I've been looking in the wrong places, but I've not seen a massive backlash against it. I've seen a few times when they've moved between editions, people go, right, that's it. I'm selling my entire collection and people kind of losing, you know, losing the rag because it's one rule kind of too many. But I think they've actually managed to, um, I think you said this, to actually turn it around almost and to get people kind of back into the fold. Yeah, they've, I think I think a lot of it comes from hiring a community team. I think like, ever since they hired their community team, and it's like there's this, you know, they even call themselves New Games Workshop as a joke because yeah. it's so different to how they've been in the past. And it's like you know, when models get leaked online, literally two hours, three hours later, there'll be a video, an official video from Games Workshop saying, "Here's the model that was leaked, so you can see it properly." Because we want people, if it's going to leak, we can't stop that. But what we can do is make sure you can see it properly, so you can see how good it is. Um, and like hiring playtesters, like bringing in the tournament guys and bringing in the people who run the events and bringing them internally and saying, hey, playtest our new content, tell us what needs to be changed and if it needs tweaking or what's broken and, and having that, that interaction with your community. Because I think, I think for a long time, and this is just me totally speculating, I'm not a business person nor do I have any successful businesses yeah. or know anything about business, but they used to always, for me, they always used to be trying to target the young market and trying to target young people to bring them into the hobby. So everything was tailored about making that um, like the core experience. Whereas I think now they've kind of realized that actually their bread and butter is like people like me, like 20 to 30 year old dudes who've got disposable income and no mortgages and kids and stuff. And like, actually they're the people who, who really spend the money. We still need to get the kids in, but yeah. they're the people who actually hold the hobby up and support it. And I think, I think switching to a model that embraces that as well has really helped. Cause now, you know, they're running their own tournaments again and supporting third party tournaments and doing like FAQs and like uh, really quickly. And like they released, um, so they released two, they've said they're going to release 12 codexes for 40k before this year yeah. is done, and they released the, the rules in July uh, or June. So they've got like six months to release 12 codexes, that's two a month. They used to do like two a year. So it's like their their commitment to getting the rules out so people can play with their models faster is like, I've never I've never seen them do do something like that, and I think that's really cool to see. Like they released two last week, like on the same day. Yeah, but they have to kind of keep up because if they're going to be running this by community, then the, this happens again and again and again. Is people sitting there ready to write additional rules, write their own stuff for it, mm. and you got to keep on top of that because, especially if you want it to remain in control, especially yeah. if you want to guess it, if you want to kind of remain it, remain it kind of pure. I mean, it looks like the um, it's not. I think the only thing I guess the only thing that people kind of are a bit thingy thingy about games workshop is the price of stuff is always a little bit people always mm. consider a bit on the pricey side um but then i mean looking at the site you know you're looking at a set of dark elders is about 65 euros which is about what 57 pounds yeah i mean so it's, it's not you know it's, it's not, not a cheap hobby but it, i don't think no. it's ever been a cheap hobby like, no, i think it's, it's always not. been expensive you know what there used to be i used to hear it like called, I used to hear it called like middle class hammer, um, <laughs> or something, something to those lines. It probably wasn't that, but it was something on those lines. It was basically like you know, it, it's such a toffee it, hammer. It, it, yeah, it's like it's because it is. It's like that's not even you know that's not even being silly. It's like it's it's a no. really expensive hobby. No. If you compare exactly. it to like to any other kind of hobby, um, it, it's pretty expensive. Like, and which is why I mean they've been really smart with with the release of 40k. They did like the big dark Imperium box set, which was like. 120 pounds and it has like the hardback book in it and two really nice armies in which is a great value but for like a kid wanting to get into it that is a crazy amount of money to drop but so they did these they've done like three or two smaller versions which are like basically giving you the same kind of thing but Mm. just smaller so like the, the smallest one is like 
I think it's like 30, 40 quid, and it gives you like two squads, and it gives you like a bit of terrain, and it gives you a little pamphlet for the rules, and then they've got a middle ground, which gives you a couple of units per side, and like a miniature version of the actual book, and, and some other bits and bobs, and then they've got the big version, so it's like they, they've done multiple price points so that you can enter the hobby at different values, and I think that is, I think that's really smart as well, because it mm. is, it is super expensive, and I think in the new rules, from what I've seen, I haven't actually like played much of it yet. I've played like a couple of games, but you don't need as many models, it seems, to play the game. Oh, I remember seeing like massive. I mean, even if I go down the, if I go to Dwarf on the Friday, and there's an there's an entire, the main community hall is kind of open to the, to the war game guys, and the you see them. They're on these two kind of massive, kind of six foot by two and a half foot tables or something like that. They've got two of them mm. together, so it's like six you know, a six by five at least. And they're full of models and sets. And these guys are bringing out these massive storage boxes of models and it must take them about takes them about fifteen, twenty minutes to kinda of set them up and then they're ready to go and they'll play for the full kind of two and a half, three hours before they pack them away. So yeah, yeah it's kind of isn't it? It's that kind of accessibility. Um I see. It depends if you're used. To, I mean, the models. You can't doubt the sculpts. The sculpts will be amazing. There's. I've no doubt in my mind that if I, if I open up the Dark Imperium box, I'm probably going to spend two and a half hours just going through the models in detail and just like. Yeah, they are. Anna, they are just, super super nice. And like the the whole production of that box makes me like it it just oozes quality like <laughs> the box art is so nice like the models they come in their own mini box inside and it's sealed by like a purity seal sticker and it's just a details like that it's yeah. like the, it's got real love to it and the fact that you get the hardback rule book in the box because that book is stunning like the artwork in that i just spent i think i didn't even touch the models for the first week i think i just spent that time just pouring through that book because it's it's a beautiful beautiful book They've always they've always been really really good at that, especially if they're tying up the kind of the the kind of the lore the lore stuff as well. You know that's kind of what you yeah. When they tie that all together, it does look kind of stunning. Is what's interesting enough on the the flip side of it? I mean, obviously, Games Workshop known to be quite expensive. I've seen the Games Work, Workshop argument being used quite recently in the. Um, the the I don't know if you've seen the fi- the tale of fire and ice the cool mini or not mm. Kickstarter for Game of I Thrones I did see that yeah yeah and they're um, they're punting it out at one hundred and fifty dollars and it's hitting yeah. stretch goals but um, you know yeah I saw that and I actually um, while I, I love cool mini and not and we need to talk about the others at some point because that game blows my mind but <laughs> for me I was kind of I was kind of shocked to see them do that because for me I feel like miniature companies have a lot of competition now from really good board games where yeah. it's a self-contained product it comes on its own board it has all the pieces you need you don't need to buy like terrain you don't need to buy like a game mat you don't need you know because wargaming you've got the cost of your models but you've also got the cost of the game which is like you've got to have terrain you've got to have you know stuff to play on you've got to have all the other bits that you need like a, a case to store everything and you need all the paints and everything whereas you can get like zombie side or like the dark souls board game or the others and you get everything and then yeah you might want to paint the models but you don't have to no. and so to see cool mini or not produce a miniatures game which I, I watched the videos of people playing it and while the game looks kind of fun it it uses movement trays and i was like this feels like a step backwards to me as a as a war gamer i was like this is while i miss my movement trays of like sixth and seventh edition of warhammer this feels like going back in time a little bit but they gotta try it i mean you know i think as a company you've got to kind of expand into different places and i think that um i don't know i think it's a difficult one because one of the first things I think I've said this already in a previous previous episode and I've said this online that one hundred and fifty dollars is just I, I can't there's no currency conversion in the world that makes <laughs> that brings that back except obviously if I was looking at Dark Imperium 
And then if I was comparing them side by side, then it would be a point of comparison. Mm. And then maybe Cool Mini or Not comes out on top because what I'm looking at is that when you look at the campaign now, now that it's, and it's not, you know what I mean? It's like, and I've heard people go, no, this is not very good for Cool Mini or Not. But there's, there's still 1.3 million, which is, let's face it, is probably 1.2 million more than a lot of maybe kick, kind of Kickstarters out there. And they have got a lot of script. They have opened up a lot of stretch goals. But I, I did mean, notice, I did notice that it wasn't very much. Because, yeah. like, I mean, their last one, I backed um, Zombicide Green Horde because yeah. I missed every other Zombicide one. And I, every time I see someone who I know and they show me all the Kickstarter stuff, I'm like, God damn it, I should have done that. So this time <laughs> I was like, because, because I got Dark Imperium for free... Because yeah. that Kickstarter was the same month, I was like, "Oh, I've got this for free, so now I can spend that money on getting Green Horde." So I backed <laughs> it because I was like, "I've got to do one." But like that made like I think four or five million, and then yeah, the Rising yeah. Sun one that happened before it yeah. was like even more. It was like yeah. seven million. I was like, "So to see, I think it's telling to see the miniatures game that they've now done to only do just over a million. I think that is a telling. I think that's just." as telling as anything else. I think that shows mm. you the popularity and, and the accessibility that board games have over miniatures games because, yeah. yeah, the box set looks good and, like, the miniatures look amazing and they always are amazing. Yeah, like, of course they will, yeah, yeah. So that's not... The quality is not an issue, but, like, you know, you do need, like, a game mat and that's part of, like, you can buy them extra as part of the thingy. You need a game yeah, mat and you need, yeah. you need, like, terrain and stuff like that and it's... You know, they do like, oh, you can get like cardboard ones, but here's some plastic ones. So it's like, it's just all that extra stuff on top. And the fact that cool mini, uh, the cool mini on at board games, even when the miniatures aren't painted, the game still kind of looks good because you're using full color, yeah. like environments and stuff. Yeah. Like playing, playing with gray miniatures on gray movement trays on flat, like terrain that isn't really colored. <laughs> on kind of like a fake kind of wooden effect yeah. kind of flip table that you would normally have at these things, yeah. There's a lot of time investment that goes into being a miniatures game, and it's probably why I'll never get fully back into it anymore. Like, it's the same mm. with MMO gaming. Like I keep trying to play like an MMO every so often. Like My current one is Albion Online, and I play it, and then I'm like, do you know what? I just don't have time to <laughs> maintain the level of play I need to, to, to enjoy this at the level I want to. And yeah. miniature games are very similar. It's like, yeah, I've got an Age of Sigmar army. Yes, I've got Dark Imperium and I've bought mm. some other Primaris stuff. But it's like, I just like painting the minis. But when I have time to play nowadays, apart from the odd tournament I'll go to, I generally prefer to just get out a board game and play yeah. that because it's, it's a lot faster. It's a lot less time intensive. Yeah. So, But is it maybe also something to do with um, the fact that I haven't, I can't claim to have seen many miniature games on Kickstarter. I've seen a few, and to be honest, I think the guys that I've... I mean, try to think. Spartan Games, maybe? Um, yeah, I think Spartan Games have done a few. I think um, Mantic might have done one or two. They've done Kings... The they did Kings of War, mm. which I think was their kind of, you know, um, hack slash stab at kind of like... Um, the miniatures kind of scene, but they've always stuck around their dungeon crawlers. I mean, they've done Dungeon Saga, they've done Star Saga. They've kind of kept Kings of War going on in the background, but it's not like you see... I've often seen um, people making miniatures for use in games. I've seen people release dwarf sculpts, I've seen people release ogre sculpts and things like that for use in kind of miniature games. It's a bold move... By cool mini or your cool mini or not, we'll see. I think we'll so. See, we'll see how it pans out. I don't think. I also, not. I also think that they've missed a trick by not including any of the cool fantastical stuff with it. Yeah. Like it's just dudes in armor killing dudes in armor. It's like what, like if there was a White Walker army or like <sighs> like dragons or something. You know, it's like if there was like armies of those guys, I'd be like, oh, that you know, this kind of cool. Yeah, I'm but sure you know, they're coming. Yeah, that's what I'm going to wonder. Is there a currently, or was there currently a two and a half million pound or four and a half million pound stretch goal that was was um, White Walker Armies, or are they going to be playing the Games Workshop game, and are they going to be, 
releasing it out as a separate entity later on. It seems to be the case, because they're mm-hmm. clearly doing multiple factions, and mm-hmm. like, how many or not have now got their own development studio, right? So they are actually a... They're not only like a miniature producer and like a like a kickstart company they have their own development team so they're designing yeah, yeah. you know they've hired eric lang and, and a bunch yeah. of talented people to have in-house so you know maybe this is their push they're like i mean fantasy flight are, are doing it as well like clearly i'm just wrong about the miniature game thing because in the last year cool mini or not have made their own miniatures game and fantasy flight also branched out into miniatures games um with their rune wars whatever that's called which is yeah. like again yeah, you know. we'll need to see. We'll need to see. As I say, it's a difficult. I think it's a difficult game to get into. I think the guys with the disposable income, maybe. Um, I think Mantic is in Games Workshop. Have certainly kind of maybe almost grabbed them for a while. So to try and pull them away. Well, I'm Privateer. I think Privateer has been the biggest like yeah. success boom in you know because Games Workshop have always been around. Yeah. And you know, private. I think. I think Privateer owes a lot of their success to. The sort of dark times of Games Workshop <laughs> yeah, when they exactly. were just, they were just shedding customers left, right, exactly. and center. But exactly. now that they're back on form, um, I think I think they are a leviathan to go against to try and compete in the same arenas is um, is difficult. But I think if anyone's going to do it successfully, it's probably Fantasy Flight and Cool Mini or not. Yeah, and we'll see also what Games Workshop do with the IPs that they've got recently released from Fantasy Flight as well. What's going to happen with that? Are we going to start seeing maybe a bit of a games workshop selling their IPs to publishers to get you know um, to get the games back out there? I've heard Talisman potentially being reprinted. Um, I think they might do that in house though. Yeah. So we might be seeing potentially games workshop saying, "Well, let's do um, let's maybe do some board games." Well, they found a home for the 40k, because obviously yeah. Fantasy Flight had the 40k RPG, yeah. which I was so upset to see go, because I really like that game. Yeah. But, you know, they found a home for that, and I'm sure, like, it's only a matter of time until the fantasy um, equivalent also finds a home somewhere else. Um, and, yeah, I think they will, they'll find new homes for their IPs. There's plenty of companies out there who would who would scream at the chance to uh, work with those IPs, because it's, it's such a recognised brand now. And obviously, if Games Workshop are looking potentially for any kind of writers for, you know, future scenarios, is there anyone you can think of that they might want to maybe get in contact with? Maybe yourself, maybe. Oh, I am. I am absolutely available. For, <laughs> they're, they're well aware of this, though. My my contacts <laughs> at that place. Where I hound them all the time, just like, hey, you know, if you need. You know, just, if the thing needs writers, you know, this you know is where your, I am. This is your two o'clock reminder that I'm able to write up scenarios. I'll speak to you again in, in three hours. Yep. <laughs> that's it, that's it. In fact, um, like this, yeah, that's why I'm excited to go to Gen Con this week because, um, my, my friends who, who work at GW are going over there for Gen Con, so I get to meet up with those guys and, and chew the rear off again about, oh, hey, so <laughs> these RPGs you've got, you've got coming out. <laughs> Sure, would like to write on one of those. Oh, wink, 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 nudge, so, nudge, 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 wink, wink. Shall we go for a, um, a coffee and a and a signature contract? Did I say signature contract? I meant uh, <laughs> I meant sandwich. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you want me to take that um, scenario from? I mean, shoes. Um, I mean, your jacket. Um, but I mean, you, but you've been doing your open legends thing. So I mean, you're already doing it. So what's what's happening with this? Because you you're going to. We said off cast in the green room, and we made the mistake of having like about twenty minute conversation <laughs> before we started recording. And then I went, "Oh, we better start recording because this is good stuff." But um, <laughs> wasting all the good stuff off air. No, no, <laughs> I could we could be recording for three hours and it would all be pure gold, Mister Rhodes. You know that. Um, Stop. Open Legends. What's yes. been happening with that? So yeah, I've been. Um, writing for Open Legend for I don't know, like probably four four months, three months, something like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Brian who uh, owns uh, Open Legend, he did the Kickstarter. It's it's his uh, project, his company. Uh, Seventh Sphere is the uh, the company. Open Legend is the the system. Um, and I've been helping out on Amoria's Dawn, which is the first campaign setting. Because the the beautiful thing about uh, open legend as a system is it can 
be applied to any setting and any kind of game you want to run. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really, really flexible. It focuses on narrative play and um, adaptation and player interpretation than it does focusing on like you know like a strict rule set. Um, so it can be applied to any kind of setting you want: fantasy, sci-fi, steampunk, horror, anything. So the goal is we've been writing Amoria's Dawn, which is the first setting, which is kind of a sci-fi fantasy-esque world it's got like um some steampunky elements it has lots of interesting things but it's brian's it's sort of brian's love child he he concepted the whole thing and and i was brought on as a writer to help him like see that vision through um he's got ryan who who is his lead writer um who i sort of work with and we've been We've been sort of finishing that off and working on the stretch goals for the Kickstarter, which is two other like smaller campaign settings. Um, so we've been working on that, but we've kind of we've kind of stopped right now because we're all going to Gen Con to <laughs> to run um, demo games that people could sign up for ahead of time. Yeah. So each day we're each running a demo game of one of the adventures that's that's currently being done. So we've got. Uh, we've got a Star Once Fallen, which is a sort of fantasy one-shot adventure which you can download for free, which is like a, an introduction adventure to the setting and to yeah. the system. Uh-huh. And we have a few other settings that we're going to run that aren't published yet, but that we're running uh, for the first time um, at Gen Con. So there's one that's like a Western, uh, that's like a um, train robbery type situation. Um, and there's a sci-fi one. Um, so there's, there's a few different games and we're running different ones each day, um, for people to experience system and just to, you know, just, I mean, first it's to meet each other cause we all live all over the place. Yeah. So it's the first time we're all going to get together and, and hang out. And it's also to, you know, show the game off and to meet, uh, players and to meet fans of the, of the game and talk to them and, and sort of give out swag and, and just to meet everyone and, and get people excited about, about the, the game. Is it going to be weird, potentially, if you're running... Are you going to be running stuff that you've written, then? Is that how it's going to work? Or are you just going to run kind of any of the scenarios? No, we we, we picked what we were running a while back. Huh. And then um, I didn't write any of the one-shots that we're running. Huh. Um, so I've just sort of taken them, read them, done some practice games with them. Okay. Just so that I'm ready, but I'm very familiar with the system, yeah, and yeah. The, the larger setting. So it's um, it's more just about getting players on ta- at tables and rolling dice and, and getting involved. So you're going to be um, are you going to be putting on voices? I haven't decided yet because my oh. so a Star Wars Fallen like takes place on this like um, like tropical island in the middle of nowhere, and it's got like. There's a race of like lizard people on it, and there's like um, like tribal. There's like a race of tribal humans who are there as well. It's like okay, like there's some there's some are like you tem- different are you voices. Tempted? Are you tempted? I'm tempted, but then I think I'm also doing one game every day. It's like four hours a day for four days straight. It's like I don't know if it's more sensible to n- not do voices and hopefully like save my vocal cords from additional strain. But I mean, I, I once I'm there, I'm I can doing just it, I'll imagine you doing do this. I can imagine you just don't. do a lizard voice then on the spot. Do a lizard no, I'm not. Voice. I can't. I can't do it out, of, do? out of context oh, of the setting. Out of context of the setting. You're putting me on the spot. How mean? That's not mean. It was just you know. Oh, for goodness' sake! It's like you know, in the moment, what would the? Li- oh, it doesn't matter. It's fine. <laughs> I have to save it for my for my players, otherwise they'll they'll know what's coming. <laughs> I have to save it for them. <laughs> it's an anticipation thing. Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm ready for my close up, Mister DeMille. <laughs> I know I'm such a diva. I have to prepare. <laughs> exactly. Breathe in. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, there you go. You heard it first <laughs> here. Stephen does not do the actings in front of just anybody. <laughs> So don't take that as a slight, dear listener. I don't perform on demand. It doesn't perform. I'm not, I'm not your monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently he's not our lizard man either. So there no. you go. Um, oh yeah, if you <clears> said monkey, I mean, that would have been a different story, but you said lizard man, so... Well, what was the other one then? 
No, no, it's too late now. Oh, for goodness sake, this is just a disaster. It's too late, I mean, move on. No, move it's on. fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> um, with your... One of the things you did mention off cast is you did mention um, the... Well, with your wife coming mm-hmm. over to yes. stay with you and introducing the, her to some board games. So, what kind of stuff have you been... Um, what kind of stuff you've been doing? Have you been what kind of stuff you've been getting involved in, playing, introducing her to? Was she a big board gamer before you kinda of got married or or was it just something you know, is it is this kinda of like a new hobby for the both of you to kinda of get involved in? It's yeah, it's something she didn't do a whole lot of before she met me, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I exposed her to all sorts of nerdiness, like miniature painting. Like, she paints more of my miniatures than I do now, because she, really? she likes it so much, yeah. But board games was... It was actually... I, I find board games a really good, um, like, social icebreaker. Mm-hmm. Um, so, when... I remember when she met my... Um, my mum for the first time, my mum and my sister, we went to the board game cafe in Nottingham where we used to live and we spent the day there playing games because I think it's a really good way for people to get to know each other and I thought it, it like it diffused the, the, the sort of tension a lot. Yeah. Um and it's just, you know, we had we had a great time and, and we made like some really nice memories and it you know, it's it's just a way to get people together. And so we started board gaming just a little bit and then if I had friends round we'd board game and she'd sort of she wouldn't take part but she'd see it happening and then yeah. when 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 we moved here or when she moved here rather because I was already here it's like well we'll go to the shop and see if there are board games you like to play so we started you know we started off with um like simpler games that like, had more basic mechanics that were that were aimed at maybe uh, a less intense audience like yeah. a less complicated one so like we played games like Kings of Tokyo we played yeah. Machi Koro we played yeah. um uh, what's the panda one called? Tokenido? Yes. Tokenido, Tokai- yeah. Tokaido, yeah. Tokaido, yeah, Tokaido, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We played that. We played, um, like, Resistance and Coup and, um, you know, games like that that were very low-impact rules-wise but were still engaging and fun. And mm-hmm. then from there, she would, like, she would find what kind of mechanics she liked so you know, she really liked Machi Koro because it was like a like a settlement building game. So then we looked at other settlement building games that were slightly more complicated, and and we just went from there. And uh, yeah, now now like we have sometimes we'll have friends round for like a board game night just because it's you know it's a cheap it's a cheap night in really, isn't it? You know, you get friends yeah. round, a couple of drinks, and you play board games. So yeah, we don't do it a lot, but there's there's games that she likes, and then also then from that. I've also introduced her to role playing games and and doing that and she seems to really be enjoying that that side of things as well so so has she been she she been in uh, kind of involved in the the open legend stuff then as well uh she's been she's been um she's been like my guinea pig for <laughs> Gen Con basically her and her friends because uh... they've been they've been saying they wanted to try role play out um so I was like well and they've been hounding me for a while to do it, so this was a really good opportunity to to not only test the the settings for me, but also to run it for them. And Open Legends yeah. is really it's a really good um, learning setting at system. Like it's it's simple enough where it's very easy to learn how to use it for mm. someone who hasn't played a role play game before. Because a lot of the systems I like, you know, like D and D. And like the Star Wars systems and uh, like Lovecraft, like the Call of Cthulhu, they're quite intensive. There's there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, it's GM discretion. You can have as much or as little going on as you want, but I like to run D and D as as is written. I like it to be a, a you know like quite a robust system. But Open Legend because it's very uh, free form and it's it's very much down to uh, player action and giving players the the sort of space to breathe creatively i think it's really good at introducing new players to to the to the concept of playing a a tabletop role-playing game so yeah that was that was really good and and that went down really well do you think you can push her into dark imperium um no i don't think she'll ever play tabletop but she paints but she paints 
Yeah, she paints. She likes painting them, and I think she'd play like a like a more board gamey one. So like we've got Silver Tower, we might yeah. give that a go. You know, something uh-huh. a bit less. You know, because I think I think war games are quite intimidating. It's like you've got loads of miniatures, you've got this huge board, you've got terrain, you've got a bucket of dice. It's quite intimidating. When you've got a board where and spaces and you know it can be broken down a bit more, I think it's a lot easier to to get into. But I don't know, I don't know how how that will go down. Mm. Have you? I mean, are you looking around at games? Have you seen? Have you guys played Viticulture? No, no. You should have a look at that. It's a nice little gentle worker placement. Have you played any worker placement games at all? Yeah, we've played. We've played like um, Waterdeep. Um, oh yeah, okay. You know, and what's the other one? We played like Carcassonne. I don't know if you count Carcassonne as much as a worker placement, but it's yeah. It's a, but it's a nice little. Um, it's a nice little introduction to other ones. No, um, I'm kind of waving the viticulture banner at the moment. I have no idea why, but it's just I've been kind of dipping into it when I can because it's got some really nice kind of single player rules but it's a very kind of gentle kind of worker placement game it's kind of self so it's it's kind of good fun I of course have been mad daft about Star Realms at the moment and I'm just Mm. (laughs) I don't know if you played that at all do you know I've always seen it I've never dabbled in it but I know some people who are obsessed with it it's um, it's very Moorish is it really? Like, it's ridiculously Moorish because I, um, because um, Colin was kind of like on it. We used to like used to like be at the club and we'd play, finish playing a game, and he'd like, oh well, what can we do now? We've got like twenty minutes, and I was like, do you want to play Star Realms? I was like, no, it's okay. And then I played it once, and it is just you just need the base deck. You get a whole pile of expansions and everything like that. And they've got a Kickstarter at the moment, which is, you know, almost... I think it's almost just finished or pretty much close to finishing. But it is very, very easy to pick up and play. But at the same time, it's so involved. If you've not played it before, then I would suggest getting the app on Android. um, Mm. Because you can... It's very simple. You... Have you get a hand of cards? It's a deck builder. You get a hand of cards. You play your cards. It allows you to buy more ships. You put the ships you buy in your disc in your discard pile. Once you get through your hand of ten cards, you shuffle all the cards that you've got, and that adds the cards that you've bought into your hand. You draw five cards. You get to match cards together. If you match cards of the same, um, you match cards of the same kind of um, group. Um, there's four different. There's four, I think there's four different colours, so there's four different kind of um, enemy types or whatever. You match them together, they double up their power, they introduce new, uh, they introduce new kind of different um, tactics and attacks, and it's just, yes. If you'd said to me, if you said to me like six six weeks ago, what do you think of Star Realms? I would have went, well, I know it's a card game. If you uh, ask me now what I think of Star Realms, I think it is one is extremely elegant and extremely easy to play and I've usually got about th- two games on the go on my mobile at any one time including try to beat Colin and Colin is kicking my ass at it because he knows <laughs> the intricacies of every single card but it's definitely it's definitely worthwhile um, it's definitely so worthwhile I don't play. have any like Android devices as such? Is it on anything else? I think it's on no, you can get it on Apple as well. I think it's yeah. on both. Yeah, yeah. I, I, might, I might check it out, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's definitely good fun. It's I think it's cross play as well. So you can you can play it doesn't matter what device it's on, it's on, it goes on to the the same server so you can play um play whoever, you know. So, so is it is it single player? Like forgive my ignorance. Is it is it you, single player or is it like competitive? You can play single player. So you can play against AI or yeah. you can play against um, other people, or you can play kind of online matches, or you can play a little kind of campaign. But oh, yeah. okay, I didn't know that because I, I do I love my card games. I absolutely adore card games. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll check that yes. out. Yes, check it out, and I'll um, yeah. I was going to. So say can we uh, play? Could we play then? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I might, I might check that out. Fantastic! I shall look forward to seeing you in the field of combat, sir. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do love myself a good card game. Like I'm really, 
I'm super excited for the new Legend of the Five Rings game. Yes. Because not only do I adore Fantasy Flight card games, um, but I also really like Legend of the Five Rings, so I'm excited to see what they do with it and how good it is. I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna go on going towards a lot of um I'm still playing Ashes, Rise of the Phoenix Born. Um, still play that where where I can. St- I've taught my son how to play Star Realms, so we've been playing that. Um, when we're not playing that, we're playing Mechs versus Minions, which is Riot Games' little darling, which we love oh, yeah, lots yeah. and lots. Um, but yeah. Um, so I saw the Phoenix game thing, and then yes. it just disappeared. I don't see it in any shops anymore. It's <clears throat> the biggest. Um, I think the the worst thing that ever happened to Rise of the Phoenix Born was the distribution was a bit messed up from the beginning because it kind of came out and then everybody was waiting for expansions and the expansions just took months and months to get out to everywhere. So it was, you start off with like a decent number of decks. Now I always champion it because I think it's a fantastic game. And it is kind of easy to pick up the expansions, but yeah, it seems to come in and then kind of disappear. And you'll occasionally get it in kind of like second hand sales, but it usually, it's one of these games that if it comes up in like a second hand Facebook group, then it just disappears. It just like people will go, yep, I'll take that because it's, you know, I'm pretty sure you can get it in the normal places, but, um, yeah, it's a shame because it's fantastic looking, it's stunning art, and the gameplay is fantastic. And I've, I can't say I've never enjoyed a game or felt that I was utterly routed in a card game because all the different characters have so many different kind of qualities and abilities to them, and it's the usual forcing opponents to discard cards or building up a really strong defense or having an excellent attack. It's just, yeah, it's... um. I love it. You know, obviously other card games are available, terms and conditions on request, but you know, it's all, no, it's certainly, it's certainly, certainly good. Is there anything out there that you're kind of looking forward to getting your hands on? Ooh, um, that's coming up. Well, I'll probably buy, I'm, so I'm looking forward to getting the uh, Starfinder RPG because mm-hmm. it's debuting at Gen Con, so I'm going to buy that because I want to run me some Pathfinder in space. All right, okay. Um, so I'm excited for that because I've been I've been keeping my eye on that for a while, and I didn't realise it was out at Gen Con. So now I know that I'm gonna mm. I'm gonna snap that up uh, and and write myself a a campaign for that. Um, other than that, I don't know. I'm just going with um, I've got a I've got a Gen Con budget. I'm just going to spend it all <laughs> on things that take my fancy. Um, in terms of board games, I'm really looking forward, even though it's really far away, to getting a Zombie Side Green Horde because I've always wanted to back a Zombie Side and never did. And now I've done it. I just want it. I want it in my house because it looks super <laughs> fun, and I think the models look amazing. Um, what else? And you still, um, you still playing a lot? Are you still playing a lot of the others then? Uh, no, so, okay, so the others, yeah, I really wish I owned that. The, um, a friend of mine, um, a colleague, he's one of my, like, sort of board gaming, uh, buddies, he bought off a friend the entire Kickstarter that they got and then didn't open and so wanted to sell on. And he got the, so he got the whole game and all of its back Kickstarter things and all the expansions for it for like 300 bucks or something silly. Um, That's ridiculous. And yeah, it came and it was just like, we've only played the base game, but there's like two, there's, oh god, there's like two, three major expansions, uh. but five additional sins that you don't get in the box, and yeah. then a bunch of other little, like, expansion y bits. But I was completely blown away by that game. I thought it was incredibly fun to play because it's, it's like zombie side, as in you you have your team and there's like you can play four of you or you can play one of you, and it's got really nice um, like board terrain and the rules are really clean and elegant. Um, but then, rather than the bad guys being controlled by a deck, you have a player being the bad guy, um, and you get to control stuff. And you don't have a turn per se; you have reactions, so you get a number of reactions you can take, which are like basically your turns, and you can take them. You can take one after any player's had their turn. 
So mm. you can take them when you feel it's most tactically advantageous. And mm. you have like a deck of cards that you do. Um, and they, the, the good guys have objectives that they, they have like a mission structure that they have to follow so they have to do one objective then they move on to another objective and there's like choices that you can make at which objective you do it just it was really really like the replayability of that game is you could buy that game and its expansions and probably never play another game for like 10 years because think, there's so many things to it yeah i mean sometimes um yeah it's it's um it's under my bed Oh, um, get it out and play it. I don't. I don't need lectured. By it's amazing. You. <laughs> I know, but I still. I've still got. You know, there is. Um, there's Cry Havoc, sitting here, which was recommendation from a friend that they. I got hold of it that way, and uh, that needs to be played. Yes, the others will go on a list. I've got the Bloodborne card game to play. That's super fun. Super, I've heard, super fun. Heard good things. I've heard, you know, I've heard people that went, "Oh, it's not as good as it could be because it's not." I think the Dark Souls board game maybe um, diluted the excitement for that because I think it kind of came out mm. or was accessible at the same time. So people went, "Oh, Bloodborne card game," and then went, "Oh, Dark Souls." Also, board the game. the card game kind of focuses on the least fun part of Bloodborne, which is the chalice dungeons, rather than like fighting yes, the big cool bosses. I know. I but know, it's know. it's it's good fun because it has that it has that level of it's almost like a really dark fucked up version of Munchkin to an extent <laughs> because it's like you're kind of working together but you also kind of want to fuck up other people over and it just it just has that but it's also this weird gothically Lovecrafty and scary yeah. game full of monsters and weird things yeah. but yeah it's it, no it's good I really like it I think considering it's like like thirty dollars or so it was thirty like dollars in Canada. So it's not expensive. No, it's um, not. And I think it's. I think the artwork's really nice, and I think the game plays really well. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's not like you know, it's not going to be on my game of the year list or anything. But it's. I don't regret buying it, and every time I get it out, um, I have fun with it. So you know, it serves its it serves its purpose as a nice little card game to just pull out and play. It probably sits in similar like vein to like Star Realms. You know, it's like oh, we've got we've got like twenty thirty minutes to kill. Oh, let's let's play the Bloodborne card game. Oh, I think, yeah. I think you'll have to play Star Realms and then you'll see. I've already downloaded it. I've got it on my phone already. Oh, have you? Okay. Yeah. Well, you can find me. And this is for anybody, if you are looking to play a game at Star Realms, you can find me by my username is Revatar, which is R-E-V-A-T-A-R. Come and find me <laughs> and let's battle. Come and, come and face me. Come and face me now. I'll come and get you. <laughs> um, we started off by talking about the writing. Um, mm. what are you got? Anything coming up? You're planned that you're excited about. You're looking forward to that. You can even talk about because I'm aware you're probably. <laughs> it's probably somebody saying, "Oh yeah, there's a <laughs> there's Resident Evil Nine, the quickening coming." Up, but I can't talk about that. <laughs> there's a uh, the. You know, well, we're already um, we're already talking about the next Witcher game. Okay, I'm sure there's a whole pile of stuff, but is there stuff that you are um, that you've got lined up, which you're quite excited about, which you can talk about in terms of the writing? Um, yeah, there's. I mean, I'm really excited about the open legend stuff. Um, hmm. I think it's 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 really like, it's coming along really nicely, and it's it's sort of my first foray into like professional rpg um sort of writing and production so that's that's uh, really exciting for me I'm, I'm really excited to see uh like that come out and and hopefully be received well i'm also still writing my homebrew D D campaign that the, the first part is almost finished <laughs> almost so it took a bit of a backseat for for a couple of uh, months while i did other things but yeah it's i've gone back to it now um, only part time because I've got other commitments. Um, Obviously, yeah. But when yeah. I get when I get like a spare hour or two or whatever, or like just before bed, I go and do a little bit to it. So I'm hopefully gonna put that on um, the DMs Guild before the end of the year because I want to get I want to run it through my editor to correct all of my obviously horrific grammar and spelling errors that I've done because it's it's quite it's actually I didn't think writing 
like the RP, like a RPG adventure would be so many words, but it's like I was just writing it away. And I was like, oh, this is it's almost there, it's almost there, and then I was like, oh, I wonder how many words it is, and it was like it was like fifteen thousand words. <laughs> I don't even <laughs> like if I'm writing a novel or like a like a novella or something. I feel yeah. fifteen thousand words. Like I feel like I've written. I'm like, wow, that was you know that was an arduous trek through fifteen thousand words. But when I was writing this, I was just hammering it away and just doing it. And I looked down, and it was this monster thing, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> they're big. They're like <laughs> newsflash: RPG books are big. <laughs> they have many words in them. <laughs> I don't know if you were aware, but there's, there's quite a number of words. I, I, you know, I, yeah. I mean, I'm just looking at the rain, and it's looking a bit wet as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in other, in other ones of uh, of today's statements, mm. um, if people want to keep an eye on the stuff that you're up to, where can they find you on the internet? And I uh, can tell them if you want, because I've got the show notes from the last time. <laughs> no, I have them. I think I have them remembered. They can find me on Twitter at Rose yeah. underscore right. Yes. And they can find me, well, they can find my website, uh, which is also like my blog where I talk about things um, at roadsrights.co.uk. And you can find out about Open Legend RPG at openlegendrpg.com. Yes, and seven. You can find out about seven, uh, the indie game I've been uh, helping to create at uh, seven-game.com. That's right. Nice. Forward slash forward slash en. But I think I just added a bit too much. <laughs> no, yeah, because I think it, I think it defaults to Polish probably. Ah, uh, there you go. So that's the English version of the site. Otherwise, unless you want to practice your Polish, then if you just go to the site, <laughs> the site Good directly. Luck. Um, I will make a promise to you, Mr. Uh, Stephen Rhodes, who writes, um, that I will make sure that before you are back on the show for your third episode, because it is going to happen, that I will I will make sure that the others gets whisked out from under the bed and gets played. Yes, please do, and I, I will promise that. You will have beaten me thoroughly at Star Realms also before <laughs> said episode. We'll see. We'll see. We shall see. We shall see. Um, this has been a lot of fun. It's yeah, always good to speak to you. We do always have a good laugh. We always do. We have just a good chat. And people just have to listen. And, <laughs> and they've had accept well. our awful opinions about everything. Well, it's two, you know, it's two white guys giving their opinions. You know what I mean? This is a podcast. This is what you came for. <laughs> It's true. This is this is what the internet needs now more than ever is two two white people talking about about things with their opinions in an authoritative tone. Mm. This is what we need. This is what the world needs. Um, yeah. Not at all. Um, <laughs> if you if you want to keep up with the what we're up to, and um, thank you for all, everybody that does. Um, I'm very very kind of grateful and slightly humbled at the moment by the number of people that have decided to tune in um, you can see us on and that sounded patronising, it wasn't meant to be it was meant to be no, nice and kind there was sincerity there, I felt it it's like, uh, you know, someone's <laughs> taken the time out to, to listen to us literally talk shit for like an hour I think, they deserve a, a thank you <laughs> at least a cup, a custard cream and a cup of tea <laughs> and a custard cream. everyone custard deserves a cup cream. of tea everybody, there's custard creams in the foyer as I said, and uh, I think the Jammy Dodgers have now gone. A little um, segue: we had to, we ran out of Yorkshire tea here in Canada. Not, not the country entirely, because that would be a <laughs> that would be a mass hysteric panic of me only. But we ran out of our supply, so we oh, had to no. get we had to get friends and relatives back in Blighty to send us emergency tea shipments because we were drinking not Yorkshire tea, and it was the worst. There's, I mean, um, I think what we'll do is we'll tweet Yorkshire Tea <laughs> yeah. and see, you know, make sure that when Stephen writes, he writes with a good cup of brew. That's true, they hand, can sponsor me, they hand. can sponsor me any day. Yorkshire Tea, if you're listening, <laughs> you can sponsor me till the end of time and I will be totally okay with that. Well, they do listen. Do they? they? Do li- yeah, they do. Of course they listen. They like you to think that someday when they're playing a board game is sitting down with a nice cup of char, you know, and a biscuit, and all this type of stuff. 
that's incredible. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think. I'm gonna, <laughs> that's what I'm gonna hope for. That's 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 what dreams are made of. We'll make it happen. Yeah. We'll make sure we'll tweet them out when the episode goes out and see what they say. They're always up for a sport. They did like a Dark Souls tea thing, which is always. Oh, I saw that. Cute. It was amazing. That's some social. Um, yeah. That's the yeah. kind of the, the that's a good social media. That's true, actually. I never thought about that, there, but they yeah. they do seem pretty like aware of the on. the sort of board gaming zeitgeist, I guess. Pretty switched on. It's always yeah. worth. You never know. We could end up with somebody from Yorkshire Tea on, and I could be ending up getting tannined up to my tiny little mind. Wow, that would be that would be amazing. Maybe that like the head of marketing for Yorkshire Tea is like a massive nerd or something. Can you imagine that if they were just like we're board game daft here and we just want to come on your show and you're sorted out for tea forever? <laughs> they send you like <laughs> a lifetime supply of tea and mugs and all sorts. Just like a lor- a lorry just turning up. And oh we end God. up getting the we're, we're Not Wizard logo goes on tea bags and tea, car- tea bag boxes all across the country. Can you imagine? That's incredible. <clears throat> That's the dream, Stephen. That's the dream. But if you want to keep an eye on where the dream's going... <laughs> I know. I feel, like I, I feel like my life isn't isn't like successful now until I get sponsored by Yorkshire Tea. Like all my <laughs> achievements amount to nothing unless Yorkshire Tea are aware of them. We're, we're going to have to make this happen. We're going to have to have an entire... Remember... Any other tea is just not going to do. Other, really tea is av- other tea is available, though. Terms and conditions on request, as we always yeah. say. If you want to keep an eye on what we're doing, go to Google, type in We're Not Wizards. We're on Twitter. We're Not Wizards. We're on Facebook. We're Not Wizards. We're on YouTube. We're Not Wizards Tabletop, but you'll find us one way or another. We're on Stitcher and Speaker and Acast and Apple Podcasts as well. Um, we're on Redbubble if you want to buy a T-shirt. Some people have, some people haven't, but it's all fantastic. If you do like what you've heard tonight and you want to support the show, go onto iTunes and leave us a review. And subscribe. But if you leave us a review, make sure you don't give us a 10, because that'll make us big-headed. But don't leave us a 1, because that'll make us cry. Leave us something in the middle, like a 5. <laughs> I love the way you're, you're pleading for mediocrity. Because <laughs> it's, cause it's average. It's average. And we are very average. But are. someone who's not been average today is the rather wonderful, very multi-talented Mr. Stephen Rhodes. Oh, come on. I am like the cardboard definition of average. The soon to be sponsored by Yorkshire Tea. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Then, then I will not be average, then I will be the master of my own destiny. I wonder if you could then get McVitie's to jump in as well, kind of play oh them off God. each other. That would be. No, they can just. They can both sponsor me. You can't have tea. Well, once I get the tea, then it's phase two. If you can't have a Yorkshire tea without a good biscuit, McVitie's, get on this. Send me hobnobs. all the hobnobs. Yeah. That's hobnobs. it. Hobnobs. It has to be hobnobs, not I'm else. partial to no a hobnobs. bourbon as well. I do like a good bourbon. I've, I, I've seen the graffiti about that, but I didn't want to say anything. Um, <laughs> um, but there's only two things left to do. And the first thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Stephen? Uh, no, not, not last time I checked. We, we Definitely were not. Wizards. not. Definitely not. Um, if any wizard hunters are li- listening, we're definitely. De- not I'm wizards. definitely not. You know, there's no. been rumours put about that I possibly was formerly a wizard, but that's just lies. False, filthy lies, rumours. <laughs> Fake. <laughs> no, <I'm not> gonna... <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> I'm very, very happy not to be a wizard. Um, and the second thing is to say goodbye, and so it's a goodbye from uh, the one and only. Mr. St- Mr. Stephen, dunk your hobnobs. <laughs> <laughs> Say goodbye, Stephen. Goodbye. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs> and it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes. Um, check out Open Legends. Uh, look out for the, the seven video game that's coming out, which p- potentially there could be an announcement just around the corner. Um, keep an eye out on other things that Stephen does by going on to his Road Rights website because he's a friendly guy, he's a lovely guy, he's a freshly married guy, so any love, help and happiness you can show him is always greatly appreciated. 
But until the next time, goodbye. Say goodbye, Stephen. Goodbye, Stephen. (laughs) (laughs) Bye for now. Goodbye.